Okay, so our next speaker is Ola Hnatiuk. Uh, she's a professor at the Center for East European Studies at the University of Warsaw. She is also visiting professor at the Kiev Mohyla Academy. Her main research interests are in the 20th century East European history and culture. Her most recent publications include Farewell to Empire, Pozhegnania's Imperium, uh, published in 2003 and the Ukrainian translation in 2005, also between literature and politics, essays in, and interludes, Mij literaturoju politikoju, essay Ta Intermedi, published in 2012, and the most recent work published this year, Courage and Fear, Vidvaha i Strach, Odvaga i Strach. First of all, uh, thanks uh, for kind invitation, and uh, I will jump to uh, 20th century, uh, which is my uh, specialization, but uh, you should know I am not a historian. Therefore, I am just a philologist, so I, I will pay attention uh, mostly on uh, narratives. Well, I think that you, you uh, will understand why. Um, my uh, remarks are on uh, asymmetry of national narratives, uh, and uh, they are based on the 20th century Polish-Ukrainian relations. My primary interest as a scholar and as a social activist has been historical acts of contemporary opportunities for Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation. In concentrating, in concentrating my research on efforts uh, to achieve Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation, I have never doubt the legitimate conflicts, and I never disregarded various conflicts of interests of the protagonists. I have attempted, however, to demonstrate that reducing the history of Polish-Ukrainian relations to the various uh, difficult questions falsifies our image of reality. My perspective is particular not because of my heritage, but uh, thanks to a particular experience. Born in Warsaw for almost 10 years, now I have been uh, living in uh, Kiev, and for the past five years teaching Polish history at an Ukrainian university, and the Ukrainian history at, Polish, at a Polish university. For a while now, I have been convinced that it is precisely the limited perspective allowed by national narratives and not a territorial conflict that lies at the foundation of the Polish-Ukrainian conflict and makes reconciliation really difficult. I also understand that many historians do not take narrativism seriously, or even deny that the narrative turn makes a difference in historical research. Additionally, I understand that many specialists who focus on reconciliation believe that the basis for such reconciliation can only be established when facts are established first. And only then would it be narrative differ, uh, would be, uh, it would be time for agreements and how to interpret it, uh, those facts. However, the role of uh, those facts in a national narrative differs, and so do their interpretations. I do not intend to prove here that the territorial conflicts do not matter. However, I believe that at their core lies a conflict of two identities, and one of, the, uh, of them tends to be the dominant one. Uh, each of these identities relies on a completely different narrative. Equally, I do not wish to prove that Polish and Ukrainian historians cannot agree on facts. On the contrary, on this level, details accepting, there is no uh, discrepancies. My goal is um, to search for an answer to the question what, of what makes Polish-Ukrainian reconciliation difficult. And uh, in uh, my brief analysis of national narratives, I uh, will limit myself to a few recent popular text books, uh, mostly uh, for universities' uh, purpose. Uh, and uh, I will um, 
take a look on uh, uh, four examples. Uh, one, it is uh, the Alliance of 1920. The second is Promethean uh, idea, and uh, the third is fight for Lviv, or Lviv, uh, and the uh, fourth is uh, the conflict during uh, uh, World War II. So, uh, starting with uh, the Alliance of 19, uh, 1920. When it comes to the interwar period, uh, the catalog of discrepancy, uh, discrepancies begins uh, already with terminology. We can recall terms such as Małopolska Wschodnia, Kresy Wschodnie, uh, and uh, as well as Zachidno uh, Ukraińskie uh, Zemli and uh, commonly used acronym ZUS or Western Ukraine. And finally, after November, uh, first, 1940, uh, 1939, also the Zachidni, Zachidni Oblasti uh, Ukrainsko SSSR. Uh, but it is uh, no less important at the narrative level to bring us uh, those terms which used to stir up the most emotions and continue to do so still. Civilizing mission, Polish occupation. We should note that the, uh, these examples cement the state of war and do not recognize to even the most minor degree that another national narrative has equal status. Moreover, uh, when, uh, even the notion of occupation, Zaymanszczyna, uh, occupatia, served as a premise to justify violence first it was acts of terror and then ethnic cleansing against the alleged uh, occupier. Uh, on the other hand, those who participated in the so-called civilization mission or Polish civilization mission considered themselves to have the right to use forcible measures against those to be civilized, uh, namely polonized. Such discrepancies could easily become the focus of a major study. However, here I will direct my focus uh, at uh, the Piłsudski Petlura Alliance. In Ukrainian, referred to as the Treaty of Warsaw or Warsaw Convention. Both terms appear neutral. The first acknowledges uh, that uh, the two leaders entered an alliance, the second makes a reference to the location in which the treaty was signed. And uh, it, is, um, uh, it means that uh, whose primary interest was, was being served. The Polish interpretation of, event, uh, of events um, emphasizes the military significance of this alliance for the victory, Polish, of course, victory over the Bolsheviks. One rarely mentions the role of the Ukrainian ally uh, in the miracle of uh, Edwe Vistula, Cud nad Wisłą. Consistently omitted is the significance of the Riga Treaty, uh, the Riga Peace Treaty signed in March uh, 1921, uh, and uh, the uh, significance for the ally completely separately as uh, it without any connection with the points of this treaty, one depicts the fate of the interned army and Petlura himself. Uh, although it is known uh, that in Riga, uh, the Polish side made a commitment to hand Petlura over to Bolsheviks. In the eyes of Ukrainians, in, uh, the 1920 alliance was not a difficult brotherhood. Galician Ukrainians, as well as politicians, uh, to name only Hrushevsky, considered the agreement a betrayal of national interests, and some went so far as to call it a crime, uh, quotation, crime for which Ukraine has paid with the freedom and the blood of its sons, uh, Mr. Shaluhin. Uh, these discussions uh, took place uh, until the end of interwar period. For instance, Ivan Kedrin Rudnitsky claimed that the Riga Peace Treaty uh, amounted to a betrayal by the Polish sides, 
uh, by the uh, Polish side of its ally, while Leon Wasilewski rejected this interpretation. And uh, it is just to bring up opinions of two persons who favored reconciliation. Let us omit the clearly negative assessment um, of the agreement as an indication of Polish imperialism, which was required in Ukraine during uh, Soviet times, and look at contemporary views of the matter in current Ukrainian narratives and negative assessments of the agreement still dominates. The opinions are united when it comes uh, to evaluating the political concept the treaty as uh, anti-Russian. But uh, one's judgment of this perspective depends on one's world view. For some, it is positive. Uh, those who are, uh, are pro-Russian, it has a negative view. However, the most common is a stereotypical understanding introduced during Soviet times. The treaty signified a ruthless exploitation of the Ukrainian peasants. Uh, and to be fair, we should remember that the Kiev offensive began uh, at the end of April, and the army turned around already in early June, thus two months uh, prior to harvest. Finally, perhaps the most important matter, specifically the historical meaning of the Treaty of uh, 1920 in both national narratives, Researchers of this episode may not agree with me, but even a uh, superficial look at academic textbooks reveal the, uh, this event to be utterly marginal in the Polish national narrative in general and in history textbooks in particular. For instance, uh, uh, in uh, Polish great uh, text, uh, textbooks, uh, which in the course of a few years uh, has undergone three editions already, doesn't mention the treaty's name, even the treaty's name, and the Kiev offensive merits only one short sentence from, it is, uh, uh, from independence to independence, od niepodległości do niepodległości. The same is true for, for example, Serhii Jekelczyk textbook, Ukraine, Birth of a Modern Nation. Of course, in the history of Ukraine uh, by Yaroslav uh, Hrycak, uh, this uh, treaty is, is uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, long passage and uh, very, very interesting. Uh, the asymmetry of, uh, uh, in contemporary narratives reveals itself in the central events that build up national pride. For Poles, it is the miracle at Vistula, Cudo nad Wisłą, uh, in 1920, while for Ukrainians it is uh, the piece of breast, which is recognized uh, Ukrainian sovereignty. And the second example, the Promethean idea, uh, while the alliance of 1920, regarded very differently by each side, remains on the margins uh, of both national narratives, the Promethean idea uh, liberation of nations oppressed by USSR under Polish leadership is utterly absent there. In Polish interpretation, an idea of solidarity with conquered nations, um, uh, it is a mission or, or a kind of mission. In the beginning of the 30s, uh, very few, uh, few political analysts uh, would uncover an inherent contradiction with, within the po uh, Polish policy. A distant vision of independent Ukraine cannot replace attempts to find a real solution to the Ukrainian problem within the borders of the uh, Republic of Poland. And what is uh, the Promethean idea in the eyes of Ukrainians? In contemporary Ukrainian education, the notion of uh, Promethean idea itself is associated uh, exclusively with Shevchenko romantic poetry, the poem Kaukas, as well as the neo-romantic poetry by Lesia Ukrainka. A few Ukrainian publications dealing with the Promethean idea uh, often uh, equal uh, it, uh, it with a Jagiellonian idea, which in uh, turn provokes association with uh, Polish expansionism. 
And of course, it is not without some influence of Russian interpretation. While we are on the subject, it is worth mentioning uh, that almost uh, one third on NKVD uh, materials, Orientirovka, depicting the political uh, landscape of uh, Republic uh, of Poland, were devoted precisely to the Promethean circles. Uh, the third example, uh, the Battle of Lviv. In contrast with the mar uh, mar marginal treatment of the 1920 treaty and the absence of the Promethean idea in national narratives, both of which are examples uh, of the cooperation between political elites, although differently evaluated the Polish-Ukrainian War of 1918-1919, uh, occupies an important place in national narratives. Uh, I will skip this fragment, uh, this uh, uh, piece, uh, because uh, today uh, Slavko uh, uh, told us about, uh, about this uh, conflict and uh, uh, its um, uh, resolu uh, resolving. However, uh, one, uh, one uh, just uh, remark. Uh, the pre-war cult of Orlenta aimed to lower the status of Ukrainian inhabitants who were not regarded as uh, called citizens, but only as defeated side. The uh, victors followed uh, the uh, credo, the victis. The Ukrainian population in Galicia stored in their memory the humiliation of national pride. During the interwar period, November 22 was designated as an officially and ceremony, uh, ceremonially celebrated holiday. The Rocznica Wyzwolenia Lwowa, Lwów Liberation Anniversary. For that reason, the remembrance of Orlenta to this day provokes strong emotions, as evidenced by the conflict surrounding the cemetery of Rolenta, which lasted for more than a decade. This conflict was resolved only in June uh, 2005, at the beginning of Yushchenko's presidency, although its resolution is still being undermined on both sides of the border. And uh, last example, the Polish-Ukrainian uh, conflict during World War II. Uh, and of course, the most serious dis uh, discrepancies between two national narratives. Uh, they are uh, occur in references to World War II. Uh, just to list them at, uh, all would uh, exceed all the limits of my talk. So uh, I will just uh, try to, to conclude. Um, it is common for a national narrative to focus attention on martyrdom of the nation. Among, uh, among uh, post-communist uh, post uh, nations, it is characteristic to concentrate on topics previously excluded due to communist uh, censorships. Uh, censorship. Uh, both these tendencies have um, um, significantly uh, altered the image of uh, World War II. And the uh, results of the research conducted by Pento Research, commissioned by the new uh, established Museum of World War II, surprised even the director, Pavel Makcevich. It turned out that in the memory of Poles, Ukrainians were the predominant perpetrators when it comes to the suffering Polish people experienced during World War II. And uh, while the, uh, they were errors in interpreting the data, Machcevich's statement uh, quickly became common knowledge. And uh, uh, when it comes to da uh, data from the same research about nations that suffered the most as a result of World War II, there is no error in interpretation. It is the Poles who place at the top Next are the Jews, and then the Russians, after them the Germans, the Gypsies. And uh, Ukrainians are on the seventh place. Neither Polish nor uh, Ukrainian losses in World War II have been counted correctly thus far. 
However, if we should accept the official data, the loss of human life in the uh, Polish uh, Republic of Poland equaled uh, uh, five uh, and point uh, uh, six millions. Uh, in the Ukrainian SSR, uh, nine million. Once again, we see proof that national narratives are uh, premised on the martyrdom of your own nation, understood solely in ethnic categories. Uh, the constant discussion, uh, discussions uh, that surround World War II prove that it is, its image continues to evolve. And uh, in which way, I am afraid I, I will not uh, be able to, to uh, say uh, now, maybe during the discussion. And um, I uh, should say that uh, uh, debates surrounding the classification of Volinia massacre as a genocide uh, in uh, 2013 uh, after the parliamentary resolution and the, uh, uh, the term ethnic uh, cleansing with traits of genocide, uh, also the other, uh, the other, uh, the other uh, notion was introduced. Uh, it is genocide atrox, genocide of particular cruelty. And uh, it is uh, not very common in a uh, uh, public debate, but it, it, is, uh, it uh, exists and has a place. Uh, logical consequences of uh, such a World War II narrative is to conclude that uh, in addition to the German genocide committed on the Jews of the Republic of Poland, the Volinia territory suffered a genocide of the Poles as well as mass murders committed by the Soviet and German occupiers. Uh, and uh, the focus is uh, directly on Volinia massacre, uh, not on uh, the murders committed by Soviet and German occupiers. As you will, uh, will uh, remember, the double genocide uh, theory, a comparison of murders committed by Germans and by Soviet occupiers, uh, has brought a charge of seeking to relativize the Holocaust. Uh, I uh, should say uh, uh, that, uh, that among uh, structural omission in the Polish World War II uh, narrative is uh, the history of the population of territories absorbed into the Third Reich, and it is the other question. It, uh, it is uh, really, uh, really problem. Um, and um, uh, this uh, Polish-centric image of uh, World War II, as uh, Marcin Kula said, is a logical uh, consequences of the focus of na one nation's suffering. And uh, I uh, should say that uh, the Ukrainian situation is much more complicated, and I, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I, I couldn't uh, explain now, maybe during the discussion, uh, discussion uh, why I, I uh, uh, think so. And uh, to conclude, I, I would like to say that uh, in the past decade history teachers at schools at, uh, and the university in both countries have uh, uh, exhibited opposing tendencies. On the one hand, there are ambitious projects that aim to create a new model of teaching history which integrates. On the other, the model of teaching mono-ethnic history supported by the states carries on. The first model, uh, for example, a uh, project of uh, Natalia Kovenko or a project of Sopra National History by Kasyanov or a textbook uh, Multi Ethnic Ukraine uh, uh, prepared by Ukrainian Association of History Teachers, uh, they are not so common. And um, uh, consequently, uh, the uh, other uh, narrative, the uh, Ethno ethnocentric narrative is uh, predominant. Uh, and I believe that Serhii Plohi will uh, say us what next about uh, how to teach history in 21st century 
and how to avoid uh, mono-ethnic uh, narratives and how to uh, change this uh, asymmetry between uh, between uh, not only Polish and Ukrainian, but I, I think in, in our part of uh, uh, Europe, in East uh, Central Europe, it is not only a problem of uh, Ukrainian and uh, of Ukrainians and uh, Poles. Thank you for attention, for your patience. <laughs>